As part of the initial lineup of 5 star units, Diluc, in typical appearance, element, and weapon type fashion, was one of your first choices for a 5 star on field DPS, also known as main DPS. With his only other noteworthy competition consisting of Kuching and Racer, he quickly assumed the throne as the game's strongest damage dealer, and the strongest character in the entire game in relation to version 1's roster, something players could easily digest based on how textbook he was. Fire characters are usually power centric. Diluc's appearance also suggests this. Red hair, cool, calm, and collected, big ass sword. Don't know why, but when I first saw him, I felt like I'd seen him a million times before. Anyways, our rudimentary and unrefined knowledge of the game's mechanics led us to believe Diluc was the benchmark of what makes for a strong character in terms of playstyle, attributes, and even stats. He was also the first and presently only character to receive a 5 star skin. That was over two years ago. In that period, Diluc's performance failed to withstand the test of time, and his placement in tier list has been in constant decline, being ranked below Kutsing as of version 3, whom everyone believed to be inferior to Diluc in every way. I was actually hoping to avoid making this episode since I myself use him a lot even now, but per your request, I think it's high time we address why no one plays him anymore. But before we do, I have a quick shout out for today's sponsor. Raid Shadow Legends has come to claim my soul once again. As I'm sure you know by now, Raid is one of the biggest mobile games out there with over 80 million downloads and endless amounts of new content featuring characters and updates every single month. On that note, one of their newest updates features the Sylvan Watchers, a territorial nature themed faction consisting of elves, true spirits, and even sentient rock monsters. My favorite one is probably the Green Warden, mostly because of the mask and armor. Alongside that, to celebrate the new year, they brought in a really cool event for everyone to partake in. There's a new season of the Forge Pass, along with the Plarium Points program, where you can earn in-game items, including a legendary champion and more. To prepare for the 4th anniversary, they have the Titan event, which can earn you anniversary points by competing in special themed events in sort of marathon-like fashion. One more thing is that they're actually doing a collaboration with Ronda Rousey, who's a professional wrestler, so you can actually get Ronda as a unit by playing Raid for 7 days between now and February 20th. There's also a promo code you can use, Raid Ronda, for some helpful stuff like a 3 day 100% XP boost, 500,000 silver, and 5 energy refills. If you're interested in checking out Raid for the upcoming 4th anniversary, then feel free to use my QR code on screen or the link in the description below, and you'll get even more stuff on top of that. You get a free epic champion named Chinoru, 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 epic skill tome, available for 30 days to new players only. Thanks again to Raid for sponsoring the video, but for now, let's get back into it. The Claymore weapon type, despite having many benefits over swords, in the beginning is actually the only one in the game to not possess a tier 0 unit. The bow class has Fischl and Yelan, Catalysts have Nihida, Sucrose, and Kokomi, Polearms have Wutao, Shangling, and Shogun, and Swords are at the top with 4, Ayaka, Bene, Kasuha, and Shinzo. The best Claymore user, at least in my eyes, would be Ito, who isn't all-purpose enough to be tier 0. I bring this up because of how it relates to Diluc's playstyle. Something that sparked a lot of interest in him was that he was the only Claymore user who didn't feel weighed down by the slower attack speed, whereas everyone else did to some extent, even Razor. Moreover, Diluc's assets were all in line with what the player base believed should be prioritized. See, prevailing wisdom at the time was premature and in some cases misinformed. Early tier lists had Sucrose, Bennett, and Xingqiu ranked under Barbara while Qi Qi was considered a must-have. Now that's a concept. But looking at this for a moment, notice a thought process. All of the game's highly rated characters were evaluated solely on individual contribution. More importantly, they were rated based on general action RPG concepts. Under the assumption that like any other action RPG, success in this game would be predicated on both clear speed and survival, Chi Chi, Barbara, and Jean were given very high ratings due to their regenerative capabilities, which at the time were tantamount to making your party invincible, especially Chi Chi who not only was the best dealer prior to Kokomi but was one out of only two cryo units available. An early roadblock for players was the Hydro Abyss Mage who took an inordinate amount of time to be since cryo sources were few and far between. So Chi Chi's rating was based on a restorative faculty and her ability to take down the most annoying enemy at the time, thus resulting in faster clears. As for the damage dealers, most if not all of them were judged based on how well they could function without external help, not so much how they would contribute to the team. While Genshin features 4 party members, only one can be active at a time, and so the idea was that whoever performed most optimally while on field would take precedence, the notion of off-field pressure being far more valuable not surfacing for at least a few months. Rather than synergizing 4 units towards a single objective, most teams consisted of 3 damage dealers of any variety followed by a healer. For example, Diluc and Fischl were paired together quite often even though there was not that much synergy between them. Due to this, it was very easy to put Diluc as the best character. Claymore users had naturally higher base damage to account for the slower attack speed. Thing is, Diluc's attack rotation essentially allowed him to benefit from the increased damage without the drawbacks of it by way of Searing Onslaught. 
His elemental skill allowed him to perform a pyro-induced attack behaving almost exactly like a normal regular attack and could be recast twice more, growing stronger in power with each subsequent use. Proper timing of this allowed Dilu to bypass the clunky attack speed of his normals by weaving in casts of his elemental skill in between attacks just as they came out, making for a smooth and effective attack rotation. Auto skill, auto skill, auto skill, auto. With a cooldown of 10 seconds, it didn't take very long for it to come back online by the time you cycle through all of your units. Also, for all you League of Legends players out there, I'm willing to bet money when we saw Dilu's elemental skill and burst. The first thought I, and I'm sure many of you had, was that his kit was very reminiscent of the champion Riven. Speaking of his burst, coverage was something that was highly sought after early on, and even now to some extent. Back then, your options for crowd control were primarily Venti and Sucrose. Sucrose was thought of as a bad character since her individual damage wasn't very good. Remember, this was before Taser became popularized and before the buffs to Elemental Mastery, so that justification wasn't groundless. Dawn summoned a massive phoenix that traveled in a straight line for quite some distance, dealing huge pyro damage in a really, really big area in front of you. And while it did drag enemies away from you, the burst was usually strong enough to one-shot most enemies if you had a good weapon and artifacts. In contrast to other screen nukes at the time, like Kutsing's, Dilux did way more total damage and had way more range. Not only that, but it granted him a pyro imbue that persisted even if he switched out, lasting for the same amount of time as the burst cooldown. Elemental infusions were also very rare, and what few existed were usually weighed against each other. Kutsing's electro infusion had a shorter uptime and expired upon switching out, while Dilux had permanent uptime and persisted, thus making players believe he was just better overall, not to mention public opinion on Electro further widening the gap. That's really what it boiled down to. While we were aware of the importance of elemental reactions and proper team building early on, the way we went about it was by combining the sum of each party member's individual parts instead of a gestalt leading to a win condition. That's why they thought Bennett was a C tier in the early game. For all intents and purposes, he by himself is completely worthless. 99.99% .99 of what makes Bennett amazing is what he does for his team. But as a standalone character, everyone thought he was bad because of the circumstantial nature of his kit. Individually, Diluc stood out as the best. Extremely high base damage at the time, a seamlessly fluid kit especially for a Claymore user, could self-imbue almost permanently, had lots of pyro damage, and could generally perform well with or without support. With the roster being very limited, there wasn't a whole lot of choices for supports. Free to plays had even less selection on who they could employ, so anyone who lucked out and got Diluc were in the clear for a while. Midway through version 1 is when we started to see a gradual shift in focus, and that's when Diluc started to fall off in relevance little by little. When Hutal was introduced in March of 2021, she was automatically compared to Diluc. It became very clear early on that Hutal's damage was far superior. Having a featured banner also meant that everyone had equal opportunity in getting her and didn't have to YOLO RNG the standard banner in the hopes of acquiring Diluc. Even so, he still held fast by virtue of his consistency. Players ultimately concluded that Hutal was more for bossing while Diluc was for mobbing, which to his credit he was still very good at, the only others at the time being Ganyu and maybe Child. Version 1.6 was around the time when Diluc started to noticeably depreciate in value. The buffs to transformative reactions like Swirl, Electrocharged, and whatnot caused the Taser team to not only be viable but a top meta party, which began the narrative that characters should not be judged on how well they function individually but how well they contribute to a win condition, removing emphasis away from the unit and adding more to that win condition. This is where we encounter Diluc's main problem. He doesn't really contribute to anything. His kit was explicitly designed for on-field sustained DPS. He casts his ultimate, then attacks over a long period of time. There are hardly any team compositions that benefit from on-field sustained DPS. If anything, that's actually a detriment to most of them. Soup teams make use of Pyro, but is a quick swap team, thus Diluc has no place in it. Freeze and Taser obviously don't have Pyro, and even the National team isn't good for him since National is the paragon example of that Gestalt, each party member benefiting from each other. What made Diluc so good early on was that he was entirely independent. He didn't care about his teammates, he was a one-man army. But that also meant he had nothing to offer for his team. Absolutely nothing. His constellations don't even provide a small boost of damage for his party, it's all about him. And unfortunately for him, with the way Genshin's combat is structured, optimally speaking, unless you're at the top of your class, you have to play for your team. Diluc's inability to support his team in any capacity made it so he would be directly compared to every other pyro damage dealer in the game, but with a serious handicap. While Shangling's individual damage output is certainly not the best, her status as an off-fielder coupled with Snapshot makes up for the lower stat line. Bennett's virtually non-existent damage output is made up for by him dramatically increasing the DPS of his party. In other words, they're able to coexist with other high-performing members of their element since they don't have to directly compete. 
Dilu Castu, and in a contest of raw damage against Oyemiya or Hu Ta, he's gonna lose. He just can't keep up with them. The only aspect differentiating him and them is coverage. He still has the best overall mobbing, but in any situation where that would actually come into play, it's more of a convenience than a necessity. Bosses and domains all take place in an enclosed area, where you can effortlessly corral enemies via animal units or are just fighting one. In the overworld, it's not like there's any sense of urgency in how long it takes you to wipe out a Hilatrol camp, and you can still use animal characters to force them together. Granted, I know in many of the clips you've seen so far, Diluc is my main DPS for overworld exploration, but that's because he's convenient. Everything works in the overworld, so it's not the best place to gauge the effectiveness of a character. Something I find ironic about Diluc is that the very things that made him so strong in the first place are the very things that are actually killing his playwright right now. He was a character who prided himself on good base numbers, crit rate ascension stat, his early signature weapon Wolf's Gravestone giving tons of raw attack, Claymore attacks having good base damage, Pyro being the element about attack power, all that stuff. Diluc is nothing but damage, and for a while that was good. Pyro was the strongest element in the game for most of version 1, but that also meant the instant a new Pyro character came along that had more damage like Hutao or Yoimiya, there would be absolutely no reason to use Diluc over them. Damage isn't a be-all end-all, we're in an age where individual damage output isn't as important as it used to be. At least, that would be the case if Diluc was any other element besides Pyro, the element that's all about raw power. Furthermore, now that our current understanding of Genshin has led to the creation of many parties that make the element strong, Pyro is no longer the best element. In fact, it might be the second worst, only better than Geo. There are so many ways to indirectly increase a character's power that units like Sucrose, who theoretically shouldn't be doing that much damage, is one of the highest damaging characters in the game. As a result, every element gradually became stronger over time, but Pyro didn't gain as much. Moreover, Vaporize and Melt have diminished in value, while Reaction Spam like Electro Charge, Quicken, Bloom, Freeze, and whatnot have skyrocketed in popularity. This lowers the incentive to use Pyro units unless they're for reaction support. If you want to learn more about that, I suggest you watch my video on Pyro after this one. The Pyro units that remained up until now were because they made up for the lower significance through sheer brute force. Brute force that Dilu doesn't have enough of due to the functionality differences between him and Tutal and Yoimiya. A convenient aspect of Searing Onslaught is that it has no internal cooldown. Every cast can trigger a reaction even when used in quick succession. Through Shinsou and Yelan, it's possible for Dilu to get vaporized off very consistently. The only problem is that Searing Onslaught doesn't count as a normal attack despite looking like one, so he can only proc the follow-up Hydro damage through his normals. Additionally, his elemental burst doesn't concentrate all of his power into one single blow like Utah's Spirit Soother, spreading that damage through multiple hits. Diluc doesn't get as much mileage on reactions than Hu Tao, with faster attack speed, a stronger single attack burst, and far more attack. Yoimiya beats Diluc through her more concentrated single target damage, and the fact that she becomes a living machine gun thanks to double hydro and arranged auto attacks. Diluc was the best because the only competition at the time was effectively Razor and Kuching, and all three of them provided virtually nothing but damage. Now every element has one or more main damage dealers, damn good ones at that. Pyro of course has Yoimiya and Hu Tao, Animo has Wanderer, Cryo has Ayaka and Ganyu, Electro has Shogun, Denjo has Nahida, Gio has Ito, Hydro has Ayato, Child, Shinto, and Yelan. There's plenty of damage in this day and age. What distinguishes the best of the best is what else they offer. If you don't top DPS charts, you better have something that makes up for that. That's what Diluc is missing and why people have stopped using him. Although, having said that, as someone who still uses him very often, not only in the overworld, but even Spiral Abyss, I feel like he was never meant to be the best choice. He's meant to be a reliable one. Someone you default to when you don't feel like thinking and just need a convenient way to get the job done. Not the most optimal, but Genshin is not the multiest game out there. I understand this is purely anecdotal and not an accurate representation of everyone's experiences, but if we go back to what Diluc is most known for, coverage, that's something I think matters more than people give it credit for. Pyro suffers from many things right now, but it's still the simplest element to understand. Diluc's very comfy playstyle makes him a consistent character. He may not get the most mileage out of proper combos and timing because he doesn't care about them. Most top tier characters only such by way of proper execution. If you mess up something like using your burst at the wrong time or whatever, their value can go down significantly. I often find myself using Diluc in floors 9 and 10 since they usually feature tons of enemies scattered throughout the chamber. I usually just throw them with Venti and they clean things up very nicely. Sometimes I use him in floor 11 if it's a pyro friendly chamber. If nothing else, he's a comfy character to play. It comes at the cost of not being optimal, but if your Diluc is sufficiently geared and maybe has a few constellations, he gets the job done all the same. A stark contrast from his glory days, but part of me thinks you can't compare version 3 Genshin to version 1. We had different priorities and valued different things back then. Whether correct or incorrect, it doesn't really matter. There's a YouTuber named Red Flame who made a video about how Diluc's simplicity is the best thing about him, and I couldn't agree more. Modern DPS units have more complexity in their kit like I mentioned earlier, which can become tedious. 
You play him for convenience, not performance. So performatively, no one plays him anymore for obvious reasons. However, I feel like when it comes to convenience, he's one of the best characters in the game. I may be biased because I have C6 on him, but even if I didn't, until the game power creeps enough to where he's straight up unusable, I don't think I'll ever stop using him. He's a good character. Not the best, but you can depend on him. Also, he has a 5-star skin. Can't beat that. That's gonna be it for today, hope you enjoyed the video, if you have, I'd appreciate it if you could leave a like and sub to the channel, it really helps me out. Also consider following me on Twitter, at Varsvaren, joining my Discord server, and checking out my other Why No One Plays episodes if you haven't yet, as well as the Pyro video if you want to learn more about the element's problems. But till next time, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon in the next one. Take care.